Hey everyone, this is Kevin from the chesswebsite.com and today we're going to be continuing our series of the 1996 battle between man versus machine. That is Gary Kasparov at the time in 96, he was the world champion and he's facing off against the IBM supercomputer known as Deep Blue. Before this series, a supercomputer had never beaten a world chess champion at classical chess, meaning just the think of the longer chess games. Supercomputer never beaten a human. So 1996, these players battle it out. We have already gone over the first two games in the series. If you haven't checked those out already, I'll have a link in the description below. I also have a YouTube playlist that I'll make sure shows up as well. You can check those out. But today we're going to be looking at game number three from that series. Just to make sure you understand how we got here in game one, Deep Blue playing the white pieces, played the Alpin opening versus the Sicilian defense from Gary Kasparov, and Deep Blue went on to win that game. The first time a supercomputer had ever beaten a world champion was in this match right here, game number one. Gary Kasparov came back in game number two and said, we're not going to be doing this. I'm the world champion here. And he ended up winning game number three, which brings us to game number three that we're going to be looking at today. So white's going to be played by Deep Blue, the supercomputer. Black's going to be played by Garrick Kasparov, the world champion. Deep Blue starts out with E4. Gary responds with C5, the Sicilian, and then pawn to C3. This is exactly how Deep Blue started out in game number one. This is the Alapin variation in the Sicilian defense. If you haven't already seen the video on this opening, I do have a video already made. I have a link in the description below. Uh, but that'll let you know, understand how this opening actually plays out. Uh, is Many people view it as the anti-Sicilian, but it had success in game number one. So, hey, why not go back to the same opening that won for the IBM supercomputer? Gary Kasparov plays d5, usually going to be playing knight to f6 or d5. Both are pretty common here. These are all the same lines that we saw in game number one. In fact, they even repeated the same moves all the way to move number Seven. So after the queen takes here, pawn up here to d4, knight to f6, knight to f3, bishop down here to g4, and after bishop to e2, pawn e6, we see castle on the king side from deep blue. Now in game number one, where white went on to win that game, we saw h3, and after the bishop comes back here, Castle on the king side, knight to c6, just to getting all the material involved into the game. Bishop to e3, pawn takes, pawn takes, and then the bishop's going to come down here to b4. We see a lot of that in game three as well. The only difference is we don't see that h3 move from deep blue. Instead, white decides just to go and castle on the king side, but the rest of the moves continue just like they did in game number one. Bishop here to e3. Pawn takes in the center. Pawn recaptures. Bishop here to a b4. And now pawn to a3. Forcing the bishop to come back here to a5. D blue continues with knight to c3. Just developing material towards the center of the board. Attacking the queen. Queen comes back to d6. Now in game number one, deep blue continued to push up the board with knight to b5. Changing things up a little bit, instead plays knight to e5, has the outpost here with the pawn on d4. Exchange here on e2, bishops come off the board after queen to e2. Gergispov says bishop takes here on c3. Both my bishops, I want them off the board. Gergispov is not having it, wants to get rid of those bishops as fast as possible. He's the world champion. He can do whatever he wants to. Pawn captures here on c3, so there's now a backwards pawn here for black to attack for the rest of the game but this position is pretty complicated and Gary Kasparov continues with knight takes here on e5 so exchanging more minor pieces a lot of players would look at this and say okay you took my knight I'm gonna recapture your knight that makes a lot of sense but then just black takes here and blacks up material not only is black up material but they have a much better structure going into the end game white has three pawn structures and black has two. It's much easier to defend two pawn structures. And also they have pawns next to each other to help support as they push up the board. Deep blue is going to have a tough spot in this position. But 
Deep Blue being a supercomputer, as high-level chess players, they recognize that pawn takes on e5 is not the best move, and instead, white can play bishop to f4. Because the knight can't move, it's being pinned down by the bishop to the queen here, so black has a couple options. Uh, one, you could see maybe queen to c6, removing the pin on the queen, and also attacking this pawn here on c3. But then you just continue, maybe bishop takes here, uh, maybe the rook comes over here. You don't want to do anything else because if if this knight moves, for some reason, maybe knight to d7, then all of a sudden the bishop takes here on g7. That's kind of difficult for black. Um, even if you play rook to g8, rook to, or queen to g4, I think it's a tough spot for black. So uh, maybe instead rook to c8, just getting it to the semi-open file, attacking uh, this pawn here that we already said on c3. But then after the exchange, uh, double pawns here on the f-file. Not as bad since it's coming towards the center of the board. But now black has three pawn structures. White has three pawn structures. Not all that bad. Rook to b1 attacking this pawn here on uh, b7. That's how play could have continued if the queen came to c6. Another option is to uh, just move this knight. You could play knight to f3 check. But then that doesn't get you... In a better position, in my opinion, queen takes here on uh, f3, queen to d5, uh, maybe queen over here to d3. Instead, I really like the option of knight to d7. This still protects this knight here on e5. So if they were to take with their pawn, we could just bring the queen back here to c7. Now, as far as material... Both sides are equal, but I think that black has a better end game because of the three pawn structures. Uh, this just seems like a good spot. Queen here on c7 attacking this isolated pawn here on the c file. I think this is good for black. If instead the bishop just takes here on e5. Well, now just knight takes, pawn takes, and then queen to c5, attacking both of these pawns. Same concept as before. Now, Gary Kasparov saw it a little bit differently than me. And that's okay, because he's a lot better than I am at chess. He decided in this position to play knight to f3. After the queen takes here on f3, queen to d5. So Garry Kasparov, uh, maybe he's just looking to exchange material. He lost game one, remember, when Deep Blue played the Alpen. And so maybe he's just saying, let's get all this material off the board. Let's get a draw and let's pack it in. I have the white pieces going into game number four. And I expect to win that game. Queen over here to d3. Rook to c8. Attacking this pawn that we talked about was going to be a threat for black for the rest of the game. And then rook here to c1. Gary Kaspov continues with queen to c4. Just saying, please, please exchange queens on the board. That's exactly what we get from deep blue. Rook comes down here. Takes here on c4. Rook to b1. Attacking the pawn up here. Kaspov responds with pawn to b6 and this is much better than just taking this material right here black takes on c3 rook takes on b7 and then how does black really continue this pawn is under attack right here it's very difficult for black to really hold on to that castle on the king side and then lose the pawn on a7 it's just not really that good from black so instead Garrick Kasparov correctly plays just pawn to b6 bishop up here to b8 attacking the pawn rook swings over here to a4 rook to b4 could exchange kaspar brings his rook back here to a5 rook to c4 so deep blue doing a good job of getting all their material involved into the game especially in the center of the board it's very nice to see how they maneuver their rooks all over the board bishop down here to d6 rook to a8 Another option I think Kasparov had is to play rook to e8. Yes, you can bring it over here and defend on the a file, but rook to e8 is a central square for the rook. Can start to push forward with material at any given time. And also, it's on a light square. This dark square bishop is never going to be able to attack this rook at all. So I think this makes a lot of sense as far as where that rook can go. But instead, comes over here to a8. And then rook to c6. Kasparov plays pawn to b5. 
And then king to f1. Once the queens comes off the board, you're usually going to see the kings get involved into the game. That's exactly what happens right here. So king to f1, rook down to a4, rook to b1, attacking this pawn here on b5, pawn to a6, protecting that pawn, king to e2. So deep blue, very much so getting that king involved into the game. Pawn to h5, attacking on the king side of the board, king to d3. Supercomputer is not too worried about the pawn on the king side. Rook to d8, attacking the bishop and just being in the center of the board. Bishop to e7. As we said before, you put that rook on the dark square and that bishop can easily attack it here. Rook to d7, attacking the knight or attacking the bishop. And the bishop just decides to go ahead and exchange with the knight here. So pawn takes on f6. And then rook to b3, defending both of these pawns here on the third rank. King to g7. We are now in a double rook in game. I may do a series on double rook in games uh, if you guys are interested in that. Uh, always thinking of series that I can do. I do plan on doing a lot more in game series, but this one you may be interested in. King to e3. Uh, pawn e5 just trying to blow up the center of the board g3 there is an exchange in the center of the board rook to e7 check king over here to f3 rook to d7 attacking the pawn in the center rook over here to d3 we do see an exchange and then rook over here to a6 pawn to b4 and the players or the player and the machine uh, and the team that kind of runs the IBM supercomputer agree to a draw in this position. If we look at it, definitely seems like a draw. Uh, no one has a pass pawn. Uh, you know, black has more central control, also has double pawns on the F file. It's going to be very difficult for either side to get a victory here. So they do draw going into game number four, where Gary Kasparov will have the white pieces. We are all tied. Remember, Deep Blue winning game one, Gary Kasparov winning game two, and now a draw in game number three for Man vs. Machine. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you made it all the, all the way to the end of the video, if you wouldn't mind putting 100 at the end of your comment, that'll let me know that you made it all the way through. Have made a few changes in the video. People asked that I put the... Uh, respective player under the board so they could tell who is white and who is black. Let me know what you guys think of that. I am always looking to improve the video. Um, so you can tell that I'm reading the comments and making adjustments. Um, also heard some feedback around the lining up of voice and video. Let me know if that is good as well. If there's other series you want me to do, after Deep Blue, I think I have a couple more games to do in this series. Let me know. I'm definitely looking for a longer series that I can analyze. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time.